Will you join me in a word of prayer this morning? O Lord, open thou our hearts to hear, and through thy word to us draw near. Let us thy word air pure retain, and bless thy children and heirs remain. Amen. There are a variety of things to be commended about emulating a childlike life. Our children are full of energy and playfulness. Children's minds are imaginative and creative. Children are trusting, especially of those who are influential in their lives. Children's curiosity drives them to explore and to learn and to continue to grow. There's a lot to be admired about emulating a childlike life. But change the ending on that word from childlike to childish. And that's different. Because we don't use the word childish to refer to those preferred elements of youthful behavior that we as adults are trying to recapture. But when we talk about childish behaviors, we're talking about behaviors that typically have a negative connotation. We're talking about a self-centeredness that causes children to think in childish ways about themselves and a tit-for-tat retributive way of dealing with other people. We're talking about an insistence on their own way that often causes tantrums and emotional displays if they don't get what they want. All those types of things we associate with dealing with others in childish ways. In our lessons for today, we're pairing together two readings from the scriptures, one from the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 1, one from the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 13, that hold together both the value God gives to children, even unborn children, and childlikeness with the childish ways that we have a propensity to act as we relate to one another over these topics that have to do with life and God's value of life. And so as we look at those two things, we realize that it's quite necessary for us to, as Paul said in that second lesson, Ephesians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, to give up our childish ways. But before we get into those childish ways, let us just first start by talking about the value God gives to children. And so in Jeremiah chapter 1, God speaks to the son of a priest from the tribe of Benjamin and says to him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you, which means to set apart. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. And that realization was a radical reorientation for this young man that we now know as the prophet Jeremiah. We know him that way because God knew him that way. God knew him that way before he was born. We don't think of him as a priest of the tribe of Benjamin. We think of him as Jeremiah the prophet because before he was born, God set him apart to be that prophet. And realizing that, coming to that revelation was a reorienting revelation in Jeremiah's life. To realize that the God who he served who he served as a priest simply because he was born into the household of a priest because that's the way it worked in the Old Testament. If you were born the son of a priest, well, you were going to become a priest because that was your, your family's role and vocation among the people of God. But to come to this understanding that the God who he served because he was simply born in the household of a priest actually had a unique plan and purpose for him was a re radical reorientation in Jeremiah's life. And the scriptures say the same thing is true for each one of us. That God says the same about us is revealed in, Psalm, in the Psalms, like Psalm 139, where the prayers of God's people are lifted up before the Lord to say, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And all the days ordained for me were written in your book before even one of them came to be. 
That should be a radical reorientation in each one of our lives too. Because we who believe in the God who creates and the God who speaks in the scriptures, we who believe in the God who gives life, also see that God values us before we're even born. And so that's why we, we value the life of children who are in the womb, because we know they have these value in God's eyes. Not that children have an existence before they're conceived in the womb, but that they are conceived in the will and in the plan of God before they're ever conceived physically of two people, a father and a mother. And because of that, we value the life of all the unborn. Lutherans for Life is the organization affiliated with the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod that brings these life issues to the fore in our hearts and our minds and our prayers throughout the year. But especially in these last couple of weeks, it has been what they've considered to be life week of 2022. And so they've been putting resources and little videos and vignettes and stories on their website and sending them out through email blasts. And if you're interested in any of that information, it's the first uh, bullet in our announcements for today is information about how you can connect with that through www.lutheransforlife.org. And feel free to do that. And if you do, you might peruse that and come across a little vignette, a two minute and 21 second video by Kim Lauby. Kim Lauby works for, she works for Lutheran Family Service somewhere in the Midwest. And she tells in this little two minute vignette, about why she has a passion for these issues relating to life. And she said it comes in her life out of heartbreak. Heartache over infertility and the inability to have kids of her own. And she said that led her to adopt a child. And then adopting a child led her to volunteer for adoption support. And then that later led to a reorienting of her whole career towards supporting adoptive services. And that later led her to Lutheran Family Service where that's what she does. She facilitates adoptions for people and she facilitates adoption of embryos and she facilitates help for women who have unwanted pregnancies and, and unexpected crisis pregnancies. And coming to that realization for her not only brought her to a love of the unborn, but it also helped her to understand the plan that God had envisioned for her from before the time that she was born, which included even the circumstance of her infertility. And she began to see that very heartache in her life being one of the things that led her to live and serve God in the way that he had called her to serve. Now, Coming to that sort of realization takes time in our life. It takes a long time to come to believe God's words when he says to each one of us, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. It takes even longer to discern what that setting apart is for and how the different circumstances in our life and even the heartaches of our life contribute to that plan and the will of God and what he has for us to do in service to him. When we come to that realization, when we come to that realization of what God has in service us to do for service to him, and maybe we shouldn't just call it a realization, we should call it a revelation. Because it's not just our own realizing it, it's actually the work of the Spirit in our lives who's given us this discernment and understanding. So once that's revealed to us and that we come to that revelation, why well, we become very adamant about it and we want everybody else to, to have that kind of revelation in their life too. But it goes without saying that not everybody values human life. NBC News ran a recent uh, blurb here in Spokane saying that homicides have increased in the United States over the last couple of years. The FBI is now saying that there were 
21,570 homicides in the United States in the year 2020, an increase of 30% over the year 2019, the year before. It's more homicides in any one year than there have been in the last two and a half decades. And it's not only nationally, but that's also true in Spokane. So the news article was running in Spokane, and they said Spokane went from 13 homicides in 2019 to 30 homicides in 2020. It more than doubled in that time period. It goes without saying, not everybody values human life. But this isn't just an issue of Spokane or the United States or 21st century America. Ask Jesus. And he's the prime example of one to whom God might say, behold, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I set you apart. Because Jesus, unlike us, unlike Jeremiah, Jesus did have an existence prior to his conception. Jesus existed eternally with the Father as one, as the eternal Son of God. And his foreknowing wasn't just before he was born, but 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says he was foreknown before the foundations of the world. That's when he was set apart for his work of the Lord. And yet he endured the callous treatment of those who had no respect for human life of the soldiers who not only beat him, but executed him on the cross, and of the religious leaders who lobbied for that death, who used all sorts of unjust means to do so, like bribes and midnight court hearings and even inciting mob violence in order to make it happen. And yet Jesus realized that this was all part and parcel to why he had been set apart. So Matthew 26, 24, Jesus said, the Son of Man will go just as it has been written of him. And because Jesus had that perspective, it meant he didn't fight back at the guards when they arrested him. And he didn't return the vileness of the soldiers who were beating and berating him. It meant that he faced his crucifixion with a countenance of love. The Apostle Paul talks about that countenance of love in our epistle lesson for today from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, specifically verses 4 through 8. Paul says, love is patient and kind. Even when people are mistreating me, even when people are being unjust and unfair, Jesus was patient and kind right up to the end. And then Paul goes on and he says, love does not envy, it does not boast, it is not arrogant, it is not rude, it does not insist on its own way. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. Those aren't attributes of love. Those are attributes we would consider to be childish. When people act in that way, insisting on their own way and being arrogant and being rude and rejoicing in wrongdoing, we say they're being childish because children have to be taught not to act that way. Children have to be taught not to rejoice in the wrongdoing of another child and not to be arrogant and boast about their good behavior by comparing themselves to another child's bad behavior. Children have to be taught not to insist on their own way in a group of other children. Otherwise, they'll make up their own rules for the game and enforce it upon every other child in the room. Children have to be taught these things. And so that's why Paul goes on to say in that lesson of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, when I was a child... I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Although we have to qualify that with Paul. His giving up childish ways wasn't just because he matured. He got a little taller, grew a little older. It wasn't just about his age, because even when he was a man, he was still acting in childish ways. Even when he was a man, he was still emulating those religious leaders who had put Jesus to death. In fact, he became one of them, even overseeing the death of one of Jesus' followers named Stephen. No, his maturing to a point of love and giving up childish ways, that was a work of God in his life through Jesus Christ. It came into Paul's life when Paul realized the grace of God that overflowed for him with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul talks about this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Paul says, Formerly I was a blasphemer, 
I was a persecutor, an insolent opponent. But the grace of God overflowed for me with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. See, the grace of God overflows even for those who don't value human life. The grace of God overflows even for those who take human life, like the Apostle Paul. The grace of God overflows even for those who've acted in childish ways and so have not treated others' people in a manner of love that God intends. That's why Jesus was set apart before the foundation of the world, so that the grace of God could overflow for such people, such people like you and me. The grace of God overflows for Paul, the grace of God overflows for you. The grace of God overflows for me. The grace of God overflows for all people. If only they would come to that realization. No, no, no. If they would come to that revelation. You know, that's part of why God has brought us into this grace of God that overflows into our lives. So that that realization, that revelation might come to others. In that Old Testament lesson, Jeremiah chapter 1, after the Lord tells Jeremiah... Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Verse 5, Jeremiah responds in verse 6. Oh, Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a youth. But that's what God was setting him apart for, to speak. And so the Lord went on to say to him, Do not say I am only a youth. For to whoever I send you, you will go. And whatever I command you, this you will say. But don't be afraid of them. For I will be with you to deliver you. And then Jeremiah says, the Lord took his hand and he touched my mouth. And he said, behold, I'm putting my words in your mouth. Well, we may not be prophets like Jeremiah, but God has given us a place to speak for him, to speak of his love before others, to speak of his love for life, to speak of his love for people so that they too might respect life and have his love for life. God's given us this place to speak for others who are in our life, the people we come across in our regular vocations. And we might say, oh Lord, but I'm too young. <laughs> no matter what age we are. <laughs> but God puts his words in our heart too. Like Jeremiah touched his lips, put my words in your mouth. God puts his spirit into our hearts to give us that kind of love. The love that is patient and kind. The love that, as Paul goes on to say, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. The love that never ends. Unfortunately, when it comes to the issues of life and the debate that rages about that here in the United States, we rarely see that kind of love spoken of by people on either side or enacted. Instead, what we often see are childish ways. We see people insisting on their own way, being arrogant and rude and rejoicing in wrongdoing. So among those who support the value of unborn life and among those who support a woman's right to choose abortion. On either side, we see people acting in childish ways. But if God can put his words in Jeremiah's mouth and take him as a young man and make him a prophet to the nations, then God can take us and lift us out of our childish ways too. Life Services is the crisis pregnancy center here in Spokane that has a life-affirming approach to what they do. And there's information about them also in your bulletin for today. It's still under that first note in case you want to look up more about what they do, www.lifeservices.org. But they too have been putting out information this January about life and little vignettes and stories. And one of those stories they've told recently is the story of Alicia. Alicia was a woman here from Spokane who had decided that she was going to have an abortion. She was five weeks pregnant, 
but she decided to have an abortion because she had had miscarriages in her life prior to this, and she had a lot of medical issues that made those miscarried pregnancies very difficult for her, and she couldn't face the emotional and physical trauma of going through that again. And so she determined to have an abortion, and she went to a clinic that because she was so early on, only five weeks, that she could do that by a medically... Uh, a medication-induced abortion. They gave her two pills to take in sequence, and she took the first pill, but after taking the first pill, she had second thoughts. And so she called the clinic that was run by Life Services, and she talked to the nurses who were there. And in the vignette, they had the two nurses, nurses speaking about this, how they received the call from Alicia and their love and concern for both her and her unborn child. They understood that she went from fear, oh no, I'm pregnant again, to fear, oh, I want to save this baby. And so when she called, they talked to her about this, found out when she had taken that first abortion pill and told her that there was still a possibility for saving the child, that it would take a hormone treatment, and they wouldn't know for about a week whether or not it works or not. It only works in about 60% of the cases. But then the nurses went on to talk about sitting with her in an ultrasound appointment about a week later when they got to show her her little child who was now only about the size of a grain of sand but at six weeks old for the first time now had a heartbeat and was healthy and doing fine. Life Services calls their clinic My Choice. They call it my choice because they realize that the decision is really up to those moms and dads who come to them, whether they choose life, and that there's not anything that the clinic can do about that. And so they told the story of another, another woman who had called the My Choice Clinic because she had scheduled herself for an abortion. And the clinic where she had scheduled the abortion was asking her to go and get an ultrasound first, but she was having a hard time getting an ultrasound appointment anywhere in town. And the My Choice Clinic run by Life Services does free ultrasound appointments for any pregnant woman. And so they scheduled her for an ultrasound appointment. And the two nurses who met with her that day talked about how hard that was, how hard it is to have her come in and to do the ultrasound for her, recognizing that and they have to leave people to their own decisions. The nurse said, I want to make every woman carry their baby to term. And I want to make every person in a bad relationship leave that bad relationship. But she said, that's not what we do. We have to release people to their own decisions. And she said, in this instance, it gave us a front row seat to see what God would do. Because after that ultrasound that week, uh, the lady went off and they assumed that she went on to have that abortion until several months later, summer of 2021, when she called the clinic, the My Choice Clinic that Life Services run, to tell the folks there about her new child and introduce them to baby Ava. These are people who are sharing God's love, they're sharing life, and they're sharing God's love for life but they're doing it in the way of love and not in childish ways, in a way that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things with a love that never ends. That's the kind of love that God gives to us. And it's the kind of love that he invites us to share with others. In Jesus' name, amen.